Hi, my name is Hilary Fincham Song, and I'm an ethnomusicologist with 25 years of experience researching and teaching about Korean music. Today, we're going to take a look at Choyong Mu. Choyong Mu was inscribed as Korea's important and tangible cultural heritage, number 39, in 1971. And in 2009, it was recognized by UNESCO as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage of humanity. So it's a very, very important part of Korea's cultural heritage. Choyong Mu, and the word Mu means dance, um, it's a dance of peace, and it's meant to ward off evil spirits. It incorporates movements, costumes, and songs to create positive energy. And I really think that this is something that we all need in the world right now. Choyong Mu is a masked dance which means that the dancers wear a mask on their faces. And it's perhaps one of the oldest indigenous dances still performed in Korea. For those who don't know, indigenous means local. So this is a dance that was created in Korea by Koreans over a thousand years ago. It's maybe a lot older and performed ever since for the people of Korea. In our last video, we covered Kang Kang Sule, which is a type of dance game featuring primarily women. Historically, Choyong Mu was danced by men. It is one of the only dances that was not danced by female courtesans, known as Giseng, because of its strong masculine identity. Choyong Mu historically was performed at major Buddhist festivals. Um, and these festivals include uh, celebrations such as the Festival of Eight Vows and the Lantern Festival. Many of you who have been in Korea uh, around the time of Buddha's birthday probably know about the Lantern Festival. Um, in addition, Choyong Mu was performed uh, during New Year's rites and at court banquets to promote good fortune and tranquility. Choyong is the name of a legendary character who supposedly created this dance. Um, Choyong was the son of the Dragon King of the Eastern Sea, who was invited by the 9th century King, king Hong Kong to serve in the court of the Shilla Kingdom, uh, which is sometime around 57 BC to 935 AD. Choyong married the king's daughter. She was very beautiful and they were very happy. Yet one day she was tricked by the spirit of plagues and Choyong returned home to find this evil spirit lurking in his home. But instead of acting in anger, legend has it that he danced and he sang the song. So the lyrics go, um, having caroused far into the night in the moonlit capital, I return home and in my bed, behold, four legs, two were mine, whose are the other two. So not saying too much, but some of you may understand what was happening here. Um, the spirit of the plague was impressed with Choyong's composure. And he told Choyong that if a picture of Choyong's face or a likeness of his face is placed at the entrance of a house, that the spirit would never enter. So this began a tradition of people hanging a mask, recognizing Choyong on their gates and door frames. This is the reason that the dancers wear the masks. It's kind of a protective measure, I suppose, but it's also for good luck and for peace. There are several key points to look for in Choyong Mu. First, let's start with the costume. It's perhaps the most fun part of the dance, I think. Uh, the mask resembles the visage or the face of Choyong, and it is painted red. And according to legend, this is a color that demons hate. So the red actually helps deflect the evil spirit, uh, spirit and the bad energy. The peony blossoms up at the top of the mask um, are a symbol of good luck. And the peach branches also at the top and around the mask um, signify dignity and virtue. The mask includes bold facial features, uh, bright white teeth and tin earrings. They look like gold too leading many to think that Choyong actually wasn't maybe originally from Korea, that he was a 
prince from the regions west of Korea, and that the marriage between him and the king's daughter was actually a union of two powerful uh, kingdoms. The costumes are made of silk, and they represent the dress of royalty. And the clothing of each dancer features a dominant color representing the elements and the season. Um, this has a lot to do with um, Confucianism, but it also has to do a lot with um, uh, a connection that Koreans have had with nature, um, shamanic traditions that go back thousands and thousands of years. Um, so there's a theory that's related to the theory or the idea of five elements. Um, and this theory supports the balance in all things and the colors represent this balance. So for example, blue represents um, east and spring, red represents south and summer, yellow represents center and the king, uh, white represents west and fall, and black represents north and winter. Uh, the long extended sleeves, um, these are called hansam, accentuate the movements of the dancers. Some of you may have seen other kinds of mask dance, and some of those types of mask dance, particularly from the Kyunggi or the Seoul area, include the use of hansam, which is a very popular aesthetic in that particular region. Another question you might have is, why are there five dancers? Um, well, this kind of has to do with the, um, the five elements uh, theory as well. Um, but the dance has undergone a lot of revisions over the years. Um, so many believe or uh, think that it was originally danced by a single dancer until the 15th century. And actually there was a famous musical treatise that was published in the 15th century called the Akakwebom. And this particular book um, indicates that the dance was uh, for a long time only danced by one male dancer. Um, but uh, particularly during the Chosun uh, dynasty, which is the 14th century to early 20th century, uh, these ideas of the five elements and uh, societal balance, for example, became really, really important. Um, and the dance's relationship with the five elements became uh, exaggerated. So um, this particular meaning of the dance was underscored. Um, by this uh, dominant philosophy, and so you started to see five dancers represented, representing each of the five cardinal directions and the five elements um, dancing this particular dance. Another question that you might have is why does the structure, um, or what does the structure um, and the movements of the dancers mean? So the dancers are dancing in formation, but they're also doing particular movements um, uh, that actually do have significance. Um, they're not just moving in directions following each other. The dancers begin the dance in the video um, that we see with a bow. Um, so this is uh, meant as a greeting. You might remember from our video on Kang Kang Sule that the dancers did this as well. Uh, so this is fairly common. Um, the dancers as well take really big solemn steps, uh, which are meant to intimidate the evil spirit. So you'll see their feet like kicking out kind of very strongly. So the kicking motion of the feet is pretty aggressive um, and it's very expressive um, and it's meant to symbolize the kicking away of any noxious energy that might be in the space. The forward motion of the arms, which are accentuated by the hansam, those long extended sleeves, um, symbolizes the sweeping away of evil spirits. Um, the rest of the body remains restrained, pretty much in line with the dignity of the dance. Uh, you don't have a lot of moving of the head. It's really just the feet and the arms, which are projecting out during the dance. Um, and each of the motions are focused on expelling this negative energy. During the dance, the formations um, address each of the cardinal directions. So um, the dancers, in kind of facing different directions throughout the dance, make sure that the space is thoroughly cleansed. The dance closes typically with the dancers um, standing with hands on their hips and they sing a final song. Now in a lot of performances of Cho Yong Mu, there's also another song that's sung at the beginning. And this is really strongly connected to the kingdom of Shilla and um, its great uh, value in the world at that time. Uh, most of the time these days you don't hear that song, but you do definitely hear a shortened version of the final song. The lyrics go like this. May we all live peacefully in a wisely ruled land. Then, after they finish with their recitation, 
uh, the dancers move away from the performance space in formation to conclude the dance. Another thing you've probably noticed is there, or you will notice, is that there is music uh, accompaniment. Um, and a lot of times when you see a performance of Choryeol Mu these days in Korea, especially outdoors at a palace, um, you're going to have a pre-recorded accompaniment, um, but it's really cool if you can see it live. Um, the accompaniment is a wind ensemble. So um, you will hear a variety of different instruments that are classified as wind instruments. One of these is the hagum. Now the hagum is a two-string fiddle, and you might wonder, isn't that a string instrument? And the answer is yes, it is, um, but its ability to create a continuous sound classifies it as a wind instrument um, in uh, Korean tradition, and so it was included in wind um, ensembles. Another instrument is the pidi, which is a reed pipe, hagum, which is a large uh, transverse bamboo flute, the changu, which is an hourglass-shaped drum, chuago, which is a large suspended barrel drum, and the pak, which is a wooden clapper you can hear, which tends to mark the beginning and different sections and the end um, of a piece of music related to court culture. Korean instruments have a very distinct sound, um, one that's very earthy and human in quality. When I first heard the hagum, I thought it sounded like a baby crying, and the hagum and the pidi in particular have this very nasal tone color, but it's really, really thick, and it reminds me very much of the human voice. While the pieces performed that accompany Choyong Wu have changed over time, the accompaniment now typically begins with a piece of music called yomilak. Now, Yomilak is an important one to know because it's said to have been composed by King Sejong, and he is the sage king of the uh, 15th century. Um, and he composed this piece in the 29th year of his reign, uh, which was 1447. So the title, Yomilak, means enjoyment with the people. It has the word min, you know, for people um, embedded in the title. After Yomilak, uh, the music then moves through a succession of pieces which are typically related to wind instrumentation, uh, and this type of instrumentation is generally used to accompany dance, particularly um, in court, but also outside of court. Uh, the sound of the music is really intense and quite majestic. The instruments play together in a texture that we call heterophony. Uh, heterophony um, is a type of musical texture when, wherein there's only one melody. And there are different variations of this melody that are played or sung at the same time. Uh, you can hear heterophony in some other musical traditions that you might be familiar with, perhaps like Irish traditional music or old time mountain music. Um, sometimes, especially in Korean traditional music, heterophony can sound a bit like harmony but it's really just a layering of different expressions of the melody. Traditionally, in Korean traditional music, there is no harmony or the idea of structural harmony that you might see in European classical music, for example. The sound of the instruments weaving in and out of each other, almost as if pushing and pulling against each other, is really engaging. Uh, the rhythm instruments uh, keep everything kind of glued together in the ensemble. Um, and uh, it keeps everything sort of steady as they work through a variety of rhythmic patterns. The tempo begins quite methodically, and then it speeds up subtly and gradually as the dancers' movements quicken, um, and they quicken really subtly too, just like the music does. Uh, this serves as the perfect accompaniment for Choyong Mu. And now, uh, let's hope for peace and good fortune as we enjoy this performance of Choyong Mu. Thank you.
Thank you.